On Thursday, we reported on NBC6 News that the government of Florida was beginning to roll back really important climate change legislation and really important climate change language in spite of the fact that the state of Florida over the last couple of years has seen record heat, record flooding, record rain, record insurance rates, and the corals are dying all around the state. The entire world is looking to Florida to lead in climate change, and our government is saying that climate change is no longer the priority it once was. Please keep in mind, the most powerful climate change solution is the one you already have in the palm of your hands, the right to vote. And we will never tell you who to vote for, but we will tell you this. We implore you to please do your research and know that there are candidates that believe in climate change and that there are solutions and there are candidates that don't. Miami meteorologist meltdown. That was Steve McLaughlin of the NBC Miami affiliate. And uh, listen, he's he's melting down because we're all melting. Shit, Roy, I am melting in here today. It's hot. It and I, I, we were thinking that the episode title for this would be "Fuck, it's hot." If only because we'd have to put a little asterisk. Yeah, and now, yes, and now you have, have to put the, now you have to put the little gotta, asterisk. Yeah. You, know what, you. <laughs> listen, Roy. I I'm coming in today, all worried about the fact that it is the hottest May so far in the history of Miami. We experienced a heat advisory in the. The earliest in the year ever in the history of re- recorded meteorology in Miami. Um, the state of Florida just basically passed and the governor signed don't say climate change legislation. And I'm worried about the infrastructure crumbling. I'm worried about refrigeration and ACs not being able to handle the workload with temperatures this hot. And I come into the studio today and there's no air conditioning. So all the fears and the nightmares coming to life. Brian McNoldy is a senior research associate at the University of Miami Rosensteel School, one of the world's most respected institutions for oceanography, atmospheric science, and meteorology, which we all know is just junk science. It's just it's Chinese conspiracy uh, bullshit, Roy. Um, despite don't you, who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? Uh, uh, you know, the governor or your lion flesh as it boils, boils when you step outside for five seconds in the month of May. SPF, one million. <laughs> Brian, talk to me. Hottest May ever so far. How does this bode for the future of our community and our planet? Yeah, this is a, it, it's a rough start. I mean, we all know that once the, the, the heart of summer comes in, it's brutal. Uh, but May is usually kind of one of those months that we, we ease into it a little bit. And the, <laughs> this past weekend was just, it was like fast forward to August and then turn the heat up a little. Right. I mean, that's the thing is that earliest in the year to be setting records is, is the thing too. Like we expect August to be, you know, like a friggin' sauna, but it's May. May. Like, so what are the numbers? What, 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 just give people, because there's people listening all over the country, all over the world. I don't think they have an idea of what it's like to live in an armpit. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so, yeah, we, we had two days in a row this, this past weekend where the, the heat index topped out at 112 degrees oh, Fahrenheit, which uh, for, for here, that's very hot. I mean, the highest ever on record is 114, which just happened a year ago. Um, oh, so we're breaking records every year then. Yeah, fantastic. Miami breaking uh, <laughs> records, man. Not the good ones, but nonetheless. No. Uh, so yeah, the, the, two days in a row at 112 is absolutely crazy. That that broke the previous records for the day by, um, what was it, 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Wait, and 11 it, degrees? To break a record, yeah. Uh, and it also broke the record for the entire month by six degrees. So in other words, the, the previous highest heat index any time in May of any year was 106. Now it's 112. You know, anecdotally, I've been saying, I'm a native Floridian, a lifelong Miamian, and I've been saying for a lot of years, it feels like it's getting hotter every year. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's purely anecdotal. It's, it's purely just my impression of, man, it's hot. like, and sometimes you forget how hot it can get in the summer after, you know, 45 years of this bullshit. But 
the numbers bear that out. It is getting hot. It is hotter now, and it is getting hotter every year. So when people say, "Man, I feel that this feels like the hottest," like that's all true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, the people who who are saying that are not imagining it. Uh, it absolutely is hotter now than it was twenty years ago, forty years ago, sixty years ago. Um, the, the the trends are up. It's it's hotter and it's more humid. Speaking of humidity, what about rain? What it what what is what is the rainfall like? What are the trends? Is it is it abnormal? Is it, um, and what does it indicate about about what's happening to the climate and what's going to happen? What may happen? I think what everybody's really concerned about and scared about, which is hurricane season, hasn't even started yet. It's not even June. Yeah, it's, uh, the the trends in rainfall are a little bit harder to to yank apart and look uh, look, look for anything too substantial there. But what we have been seeing, I think in recent years is more instances of extreme rainfall. So even though you're, um, let's say your total over a month, uh, or our total o- over a year is not trending that strong. We are seeing more instances of extreme rainfall. So, you know, how much rain can shorten a, or how much rain can fall in a short period of time, uh, which, of uh, of course, we know that that creates giant messes. We've seen a few examples just within the last year, year and a half of that around. Absolutely. And we're here in downtown Miami, uh, right by Bayside, which is ground zero, not just for aliens, mind you, uh, but also for uh, sunny day flooding. And uh, yeah. obviously, if it if it will flood in the sunshine, it gets really bad uh, in the rain. Right over here is where Miami's own Big Dig is happening, just north of the studio, the so-called uh, billion-dollar signature bridge that just look, I mean, it just turns into an absolute ocean uh, whenever there's a, there's a downpour of, of any kind. And it gets, it gets, I mean, it's untenable. Like, you just can't go anywhere or do anything and mix that rainfall with the heat, with the mugginess, with the skeeters, uh, you know, that's and uh, it gets pretty it gets pretty terrible. And what do we know or what we don't know anything, but what what indicators do we have for because obviously when there could be a busy hurricane season, we don't know what or how many storms will ever make landfall. But obviously, if it's a busy season, odds are we're going to you know, we're going to be threatened at some point um, or several points. So what are we anticipating or what should we look out for? What are the warning signs for this hurricane season? Yeah, this is this is a, a, an action packed question. Um, <laughs> so what we're looking at here in May, we're looking forward to the next few months to a combination of environmental factors that we've never experienced before. Uh, so, you know, that's that's just excellent when you have no history to learn from or anything, <laughs> of course. We just we just love that. Um, so the, the, the two things coming together. One, we have uh, La Nina coming, which all other things being equal, La Nina's act to enhance Atlantic hurricane activity. OK, not great for us. Um, but then in addition to that, the Atlantic Ocean in, in the tropics, the Gulf of Mexico, is all warmer than it's ever been also. And those warm anomalies are expected to continue into the, the heart of hurricane season. So we've got a La Nina combined with ocean temperatures that have never been this warm. So what, what could possibly go wrong? Huh. I think what people may, may or may not understand is that, is that the heat warms the ocean and is that warm water that really fuels right these these yeah. storms? So that's why yeah. they become hurricanes. Love warm water. They they need it. The warmer it is, the the more ecstatic they become. <laughs> and that I guess increases the category and the severity of of hurricanes. Yeah, yeah. It can make them stronger. It makes things like um, there's this rap, uh, rap, rapid intensification becomes more likely where they can go from like a category one to three or four in one day, you know, that, that becomes more likely when you have really warm ocean temperatures. And what about this, I, this talk of perhaps creating a category six hurricane right now, it only goes up, what? it only goes up to five, but this Roy, this feels to me a little bit like the, the amp that goes up to 11 in spinal tap, you know, yeah. like it's like, well, <laughs> this one goes up to 11. It's like, we can't, we just have like, Category five, like we know, I mean, obviously you might have to increase what the intensity, they, it's not even that. It's like category five is anything over a certain threshold, yeah. right? I mean, do we yeah. need a cat six? What do we need? No, 
Um, I, I don't think so. It's it really it was just kind of a thought exercise that the the authors of that <laughs> paper put out there. Uh, because I mean, using the the numbers that they proposed, there actually would not have ever been a Category Six in the Atlantic <laughs> uh -huh. at all. Um, uh -huh. The closest one would have been in 1980. Mm. Um, we, we haven't come close to what they would say a Category 6 would be since then. Yeah, we don't do thought exercises on this show, uh, Brian. Okay, Brian. fine, so, good. So, uh, <laughs> last question before we go. I often talk about a corruption tax that we all pay here in Miami, whether we like it or not. And it is a real tax. It is real money out of our pockets that, uh, that, that could otherwise be used to, you know, feed and clothe and house our families. But there is also statewide a what I call a climate change tax or a hurricane tax. This to me is like like if people don't care about the environment or the climate or the oceans or they aren't scared of hurricanes uh, for whatever reason um, or they don't or they live in you know areas that aren't low lying and don't flood like we experience here in in uh, the lost city of Miami or soon to be lost city of Miami. People should care in Florida because everybody pays this tax. How does it manifest itself, though, for like why people should care because this hits their pocketbooks and their bank accounts? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, there are aspects of climate change and just the climate in general here that cost people money. Um, if you I mean, let, let's go back to the, the, the heat topic. Crazy heat. Um, if you have air conditioning, excellent, but it's going to gradually cost you more and more and more. Mm -hmm. It puts more and more stress on the infrastructure to provide air conditioning at the peak hours of the day. Um, for people without air conditioning, I mean, it, it's a significant health concern. Yeah. And as Bloomberg reported this week, Florida has experienced, and this is just an average, 125% surge in property insurance bills. And that means that some people are experiencing upwards of 200% uh, or more increases. Um, Brian, how does that, I mean, does climate change and hurricanes have something to do with that? I imagine as hurricanes hit and damage is done and insurance companies have to cover those costs, they have to, those expenses have to somehow get passed back to the, cu uh, the customer, no? Yep. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately the way it goes for us. And insurance is is absolutely one of the biggest topics in Florida um, for the, the, the hurricane insurance is just mind numbingly out of control. Uh, and it, it's uh, yeah, I, I, I wish I had an answer, um, but it's it's one of those things that is becoming a reason that people need to move. They can't afford to insure their, their houses anymore. Absolutely. Businesses are closing down. People are moving out of the state, particularly uh, Miami. I think Miami-Dade County uh, had a net population decrease once again uh, this mm -hmm. past year. Um, and uh, what did you say? Mind-numbingly, mind what was the, the turn of phrase? My, whatever it is, mind-numbingly out of control. I think that's what people call this show um, yeah. <laughs> as well. Uh, Brian McNoldy, uh, find him at B McNoldy on uh, the platform formerly known as Twitter. He is a, a great uh, follow if you enjoy existential dread. Uh, Brian, <laughs> yes. thanks so much uh, for being here. Please, please come back and see us again if there is a place to come back and see us again. I would love to, thank you. Uh, but if these students have the ability uh, to get mentorship, uh, to get counseling from faith leaders, that is something that they should have the right to pursue if that is what they want. And this bill ensures that. And I think it's going to make a positive impact on a lot of students throughout the state of Florida. Now, some have said that if you do uh, a school chaplain program, that somehow you're going to have uh, Satanists running around in all our schools. I just understand, we're not playing those games in Florida. Uh, that is not a religion. That is not qualifying to be able to participate uh, in this. So we're going to be using common sense uh, when it comes to this. So you don't have to worry about that. So the frightening thing about common sense is who's sense are we talking about and well common sense isn't common there billy no it's not common and particularly not in in florida where we are immune to reason and sanity more importantly if it doesn't upset you that the governor of anything is telling us what is and isn't a real religion Christ 
So the state of Florida just passed the governor, Ron DeSantis, uh, signed a law into a uh, into an effect that will allow school boards, or in fact, I think force them to vote as to whether or not they want religious ministers, chaplains, they're calling them, in public schools. To These are untrained people. These are unlicensed people. I think they just have to register and pass like a, a background check. And then they're just welcome to come and minister to uh, children in public schools. Now, the Satanic Temple is a non-theistic religious organization that fights for religious liberty, recognized by the IRS as a religion. Roy, they do not worship Satan, nor to my understanding do they even believe in the existence of Satan or anything supernatural for that matter. According to their website, thesatanictemple.com, your new homepage, Roy, they believe in reason, empathy, and the pursuit of knowledge. They the say, complete opposite of Satan. They say, quote, Satanists should actively work to hone critical thinking and exercise reasonable agnosticism in all things. Our beliefs must be malleable to the best current scientific understandings of the material world, never the reverse. Co-founder Lucian Greaves joins us now. Lucian, thanks so much for being here on Because Miami. First thing I'd like you to do is respond to Florida Governor uh, Ron DeSantis uh, and his uh, remarks there at that recent press conference. Well, to put it politely, he's full of shit on every level. Um, he's, he's wrong about us not being a religious organization. We're recognized as one by the IRS, and that's been upheld by a federal ruling since then. And we have all the benefits that a religion is coming to us that is, are coming to us from being a religious organization constitutionally. And for a governor to stand up and say that he's going to bypass the Constitution itself because he doesn't like the ramifications of endorsing pluralism in a particular circumstance is a horrible precedent. It's just a horrible thing to say. It's, uh, it's obviously irresponsible, it's divisive, and it has no legal weight whatsoever. The bill itself does not do anything to exclude us. And him standing up at a podium delivering these uh, proclamations by fiat hold absolutely no legal weight. So if he has any competence whatsoever, he should realize that he's simply grandstanding in front of people. He's counting on people to forget this the next day. He's counting on people to forget that when Satanist chaplains are in the schools, that he invited them. But I guarantee you, we will remind them when we are in the schools and we have our, our chaplains there, we will be sure that people recognize that it is because of Ron DeSantis and he made it so. Now, I want to understand what that means, because you have in other states and other uh, school systems uh, where there have been religious clubs and after school organizations, uh, you have fought and gotten uh, the courts to and school boards to obviously be, to be forced to agree to have uh, Satanist or, or Satanic Temple clubs as well. So people understand, what would a Satanic Temple club, or in this case, minister, minister to, uh, to students in public schools? Well, similar to our after-school Satan clubs, we would want our chaplains to be there as an alternative to somebody who's going to try to deliver indoctrination and proselytizing to people. We would hope that they would actually fulfill the role that people like DeSantis are saying they will to uh, provide more resources for children who need emotional support. We know that's not the real reason they want chaplains in the schools. They want the chaplains in schools to endorse religion and to bring Christianity into schools. But we want, we, we want to provide the pluralism, the benefits. We want, we want to show people that you can't just preference one viewpoint over another or give one viewpoint the uh, stamp of authority of the government. And in case that is useful to the children, it will be there. But don't get me wrong. While our after school clubs, I think, are a good thing, and I don't really necessarily mind if school districts have religious after school clubs so long as pluralism is being respected, I think the chaplains are a horrible idea. And I think our presence is just trying to mitigate some of the things that are horrible about it. But at the end of the day, I think they absolutely shouldn't be there. The reasons they give for putting chaplains in schools sound spurious at best. And I, I just think 
they're bringing their culture wars into the school districts again, and they're not thinking about what this actually means for children in practice. I think this is interesting, too, because basically what you're saying is you don't really want to have uh, Satanist ministers or chaplains in the public schools in Florida. You don't want any chaplains in public schools in Florida, and you're attempting to illustrate the absurdity of this and the idea that the law itself cannot discriminate against your religion any more than it could, you know, Judaism or Islam or Christianity or Catholicism or Buddhism. You either need all or you need none. To that point, there is uh, a, a, a mother from the Fort Pierce uh, area, and uh, this is a great story from the uh, local affiliate there, uh, WPTV, um, where immediately in real time, she started to rethink the wisdom of this policy. The Satanic Temple says they want ministers on campus too. Some folks originally in support are switching sides. Well, that makes me want to think maybe we should just keep maybe all of it out <laughs> and just, I know I just like completely like flip-flopped and reversed. That is uh, Cheyenne Bingham, a conservative mom from Fort Pierce that supported the idea of these chaplains when she thought it was only going to be chaplains that represented, I guess, the religion that she decided she once represented uh, and that she ref that she would think is a quote unquote real religion. The rest of her quote, uh, Lucian, is I know I just completely flip flopped and reversed, but that way, you know, no matter what religion you are, you don't have to worry about any influence of a different religion. Uh, is this what we call a come to Jesus moment or a come to Satan moment? Like what? Like you can practically see a light bulb go on over her head when she realizes, oh, I see if we have to allow all religions, including Satanism, maybe we shouldn't have religions in our public school this way. I what think do you it's want to a come to democracy moment. <laughs> I think it's, it's coming to understand the value in having that kind of separation between church and state. Yeah, well, these are long time standards we've had and these kinds of uh, uh, walls we've had built up were part of an evolutionary process as we learn to kind of live with each other, coexist and not be in a state of constant civil war. And now we have people kind of provoking those things. And I think it's nice when people come to the realization and begin to see that perhaps the greater evil here is in allowing the government to dictate to people what is appropriate religious expression, what is not, when you actually have government functionaries, like somebody as irresponsible as DeSantis, getting himself involved in the most granular and personal of issues that could possibly be in somebody's lives. And I think even Christians begin to notice that they don't necessarily want followers by coercion. They, you know, they want people to come to the truth as they see it. They want people uh, not, not to be held under the thumb of government authority, coercing them to, to take certain viewpoints, and none of us do. And I think that's what's really at stake here. As Billy said it uh, before the interview started, you don't actually believe in Satan or any religion, actually. You're just using this as a symbol, an over-the-top bang, <laughs> bang somebody in the head with a sledgehammer symbol just to get it out there. Well, I want to ask you that. That's a good point, Lucian. You've been accused that the Satanic Temple has been around for, what, about a decade, I think, now? You've been accused, or the organization's been accused of being a joke, a stunt, a hoax, dismissed as, as trolls. But this has also gotten pretty serious. I mean, I mean, life and death kind of serious. Not only is your membership up, but you've been become the targets of some grave threats and, in fact, real violence. So this isn't just a symbol or, or a joke of some kind, is it? No, we, we truly believe in these values and we're fighting for them with our lives. And people look at the fact that we're non-theistic and take that to mean we don't really believe in what we're doing. But to us, even that symbolic construct of Satan as the ultimate rebel against tyranny is something that's inextricable for us from our identity. And we try to live by the, the values that the kind of narrative uh, constructs for us. So it's, it's also you know, something we identify with, but we also think that people's response, while it's expected, it also serves a greater good and hopefully getting people to realize that there's always more than one side to the story. You really do have to evaluate people based upon what they do, 
what they truly believe, how, how they interact with the real world rather than these assumptions we post pasted on people under this assumption that they're working with the ultimate evil or that the ultimate evil is embodied and personified in a uh, in some character that's conducting his minions below, uh, above or, or below. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think we have all the aspects of a religious community. We, we have people, uh, you know, congregationally worldwide and they, they do, they do rituals and everything else uh, in a non superstitious fashion. I think you'll understand that when you think about weddings and funerals and how there's not necessarily any, uh, supernaturalism tied to those, but uh, non-theistic or not, it's a real religion. I hope people can, if not, try to bother to understand what we actually believe in practice, at least respect the fact that, as I said, the greater evil is in allowing the government to dictate those types of viewpoints. Again, Roy, I just think it's scary when you have someone from the government saying something is not a real religion. You may feel that way. In fact, there are religions who do not identify, respect, or, you know, other religions. They say we are the only true and correct God and the only true and correct way to live your life and ensure that you are prosperous and go to heaven or whatever you may believe in. It's just like there's people who say Mormonism isn't real, Judaism isn't real, Scientology isn't a real religion. Who do we let make that decision? If that is your your belief system, if those are your core values— who, why is the government able to say, well, when we say we want religious chaplains in schools, we don't mean your religious chaplains. We mean these religious chaplains. Oh, that's BS. No, totally, totally BS. Lucian Greaves, thesatanictemple.com. I'm sure you wind up on some government watch list if you navigate to this webpage, but I will tell you, Roy, it's actually incredibly informative and kind of turns uh, t- turns what your idea or perception of them might be uh, on your head. Um, if if you care about the First Amendment, if you care about true religious liberty, uh, check out thesatanictemple.com. It's not what you think it is. Lucian Greaves, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Hey, Billy, what happened to that DNC chair campaign? What was going on with that? Why why did you stop that? Hey, Roy, that was a real, like, you can't do that on television, kind of like opening up the locker. Oh, we needed some hey, slime. I got some hey, water right here. Hey, Billy. Hey, Roy. I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, you mean my week-long campaign to be Miami-Dade Democratic chair? The yeah. old grand opening, grand closing yeah, uh, that, on that campaign? That one, yeah. Yeah, that is a long, crazy story. I did not lose the election. I pulled out. Speaking of pulling out, we should do this Wheel of Despair. And I'll tell you next week about, about that other shit. Oh, okay, next week. I'm looking forward to that. Plenty of time. <laughs> if we're not on hiatus again next if week. We're not on hiatus again. <laughs> Is there going to be air conditioning next week? I'll be here if there's air conditioning here. I, I don't know. I'm probably right. going to melt before I find out. So uh, here's the uh, list for this week's Wheel. Uh, <laughs> World Cup half full. <laughs> World Cup half empty, if you ask me. Yeah, well, I'm a realist. Uh, Tricky Vicky. <laughs> yes, my friend. Yeah, your, your buddy. <laughs> the algorithm's going to get you. The algorithm's going to get you. Nice uh, Miami Sound Machine pun there. Mm-hmm. Miami no shit report. <laughs> well, Miami's full of shit report, maybe. Oh, uh, yeah. The complete opposite. And um, <laughs> GOP threesome. GOP threesome. Are we talking about golf or what are we talking about? We are not about? talking about golf. <laughs> okay, GOP threesomes. Can't wait. Let's spin the wheel. <laughs> Three, the threesomes. GOP threesomes. <laughs> you uh, Republicans are freaky. Freaky. And I and I don't I don't mind it. I'm here for it. The problem is the hypocrisy. FloridaTrident.org. You might remember uh, some months ago we had Bob Norman on, Mm -hmm. who was covering the story of disgraced ex-Florida GOP chair Christian Ziegler and his wife, who is a Sarasota, Florida school board member and the co-founder of the racist, anti-LGBTQ, right-wing, book-banning hate group Moms for Liberty, a.k.a. Clanned Karenhood, a.k.a. Moms for Taking Liberties. She boasts that she helped write Florida's Don't Say Gay Law. Well, turns out that they have been engaging in threesomes and, according to a police report, have been, quote, on the prowl, end quote, in bars for women to bring home. And so you might remember one of the threesome partners had accused Christian Ziegler 
uh, of sexually assaulting her. The police investigated, seized phones and evidence and videos, and um, they did not charge him. They cleared him of that. But in the meantime, the Ziegler's are trying to get a court to seal the evidence they seized. A lot of this is personal and private material, text messages. Uh, they found Investigators found, quote, numerous sexual videos, end quote, on Christian Ziegler's phone involving the couple and other women. Um, And, quote, there were numerous text messages between Bridget and Christian where they are on the prowl for a female. And Bridget is directing him to numerous different bars in search of a female that they are both interested in. During these conversations, Christian is secretly taking photographs of women in the bars and sending them to Bridget asking if she wants this one or that one. Bridget is telling him to pretend to take pictures of his beer so they don't see him taking pictures of them. She tells him, quote, don't come home until your dick is wet, end quote. Uh, Okay, did he uh, stick his dick in the beer? (laughs) I don't know if that's what she meant, Mm -hmm. but but we'll extend an invitation to the Zieglers to have them on the show. Yeah, we got questions. (laughs) Roy, Roy has questions. Roy, I, 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 get your girl on the phone. Bridget I'm a journalist. Ziegler, get your girl on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Roy is a journalist, damn it, and he's got questions. <laughs> okay. All right, let's uh, let's spin this wheel before I, uh, before my wife divorces me. Again. <laughs> World Cup half full. Sports welfare. More sports welfare. Broke-ass taxpayers making it rain on millionaires and billionaires. It's the way of the world. The Miami-Dade County Commission just awarded uh, about $36 million in public funding and free services uh, to the seven matches coming to the Hard Rock Stadium in 2026. This is on top of the $15 million in cash and prizes that we gave to billionaire uh, Dolphins and Hard Rock Stadium owner uh, Stephen Ross uh, back in 2022. Um, that's part of a deal that gives him basically bonus money for securing certain special events like Super Bowls and, and in this case, uh, World Cup. So it's welfare for millionaires or billionaires, all while there's no air conditioning at the Medley County uh, Animal Services facility during, oh, yeah, during, a re- or the, <laughs> during a record hot summer, but yet we are giving tens of millions of dollars away to millionaires and billionaires for, for t- to watch a bunch of guys kick a ball around. Uh, I, I'm, I love that the World Cup is going to be here. I just don't see this whole idea that, I, I mean, I got to get it straight in my head, uh, Roy, capitalism is when you steal money from the poor and middle class and give it to the super rich. And when you tax the super rich to help the poor and middle class, oh, they get taxed. That's called socialism. They get taxed. That's, that's what wow. I have to get straight uh, in my head. Um, but rest assured, by the way, this thirty-six million dollars that the county is giving of our money to FIFA of all organizations for crying out loud. By the way, an organization both MLS and FIFA are represented by my mayor Francis Suarez's um, law firm. Your mayor. Your, your boy, Francis nah, Suarez. Nah, nah, don't you <laughs> dare. How can I help? The This is not going to be the end of it. Before the end of this year, they're going to give uh, at least 10, if not more, million dollars uh, from our uh, taxpayer money that could go to help people do real things, shore up infrastructure, mitigate climate change and sea level rise and flooding and, you know, all the things we need to do. They're going to they're going to basically uh, give that money away to millionaires and billionaires. I just, this is not a thing. Even, even David Sampson, or Dave, as I know him as, Dave Sampson, and I like kind of agree on the, ultimately, for all the benefits, the intangible benefits you might think come from having these major duty sporting events in your community, and I agree with that, the ultimate beneficiary of all of this are the teams and the leagues. Uh, and of course the politicians who wind up getting free tickets and free access and ultimately, usually in some form or another, uh, some kind of donations. I'm using, I'm doing hard, I'm doing hard air quotes. I'm getting carpal tunnel. Um, But yeah, stop sports welfare, man. Stop it. 
I mean, come on. I'm holding out for a new arena for the Panthers in Broward County. God, here, you're, yeah, you're, you're trying you're, to move them out east towards uh, Fort Lauderdale here. Come on, man, give me a break. Oh, my God. No, stop. They, the taxpayers already built them. I'm sorry, taxpayers have built them two arenas. Theoretically, Dade County built the Miami Arena, which I believe is, is one of the greatest deals in the history of sports welfare because it's the best ROI because it got us two professional sports franchises and it cost about $50 million which is a, a bargain. And it was obsolete the day they broke ground on it, but that's not the point. It actually like, did what it's supposed to do in the best-case scenario, which got us an NBA franchise and got us an NHL uh, franchise. And since then, we've now built how many fucking monstrosities? How many, of the, how many, how many albatrosses of concrete do we need to have that sit empty for m- the vast majority of the year? Hard Rock has to be one of the most activated NFL venues in the country because it has so many of these ancillary events. There's F1 and there's uh, World Cup and there's tennis and there's all kinds of shit. But it's still only activated for less than 40 days out of the year. Otherwise, you just have this giant thing and, and all of this parking around it that just sits empty there for 330 days or 320 days out of the year. It's, it's not something we should be investing in. Oh, man. I'm just... Yeah, uh, uh, hang, hang on, hang on. I, I, I gotta... I totally, totally have a uh, card for this. Okay. No one's listening! Hmm. Okay. Spin the wheel. Uh, the algorithm's gonna get you. <laughs> we have biometric technology. So, we've been talking about John Ruiz. John Ruiz! The former Miami Hurricanes NIL sugar daddy. I say former because I don't know when the last time he made a deal uh, or uh, signed up any of these players to help them out. He signed up a lot of them, though, and used a lot of money uh, to make it rain on the Canes. But it now seems that his company, uh, Life Wallet, a publicly traded company, in an annual report that they filed last month, revealed that federal civil and criminal subpoenas are seeking corporate documents about the company's data analytics, as well as its stock price decline, marketing materials, and agreements offered to potential investors. We have biometric technology. This is something that we've been talking about on this program for a couple years, back when Kane's whole Twitter was ripping us for being nothing but haters, because in Miami, as you know, uh, you know, this is the place where lies are love and the truth is hate. If you just say what the obvious thing is that's happening right in front of you, that there might be some disingenuous or shadiness going on here, perhaps we need to be a little bit more careful or cynical or question when Miami... Uh, boosters start to uh, start to open their wallets and get generous that like maybe we have to do a better job as an institution of protecting our student athletes. Everybody jumped down our throats. They jumped down Dan's throat, your throat. Uh, Mike Ryan was on here. Well, Mike, Mike, I think that day he was Mike Ruiz because he was here defending his uncle John. Mm-hmm. They're not asterisk. They're not. There is no relation. Addendum. Uh, there, yes, there is a footnote. No relation. There's no relation between Mike Ryan and John Ruiz. But the bottom line is, is that we were skeptical. Roy, we said, what is going on here? He's talking about these. We have biometric technology. And these proprietary algorithms that sounded a little dubious and we were sound like he was making it up we were questioning the 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 validity of that and now you know who else is questioning that the uh federal government fbi open up that's right the feds both criminally and civilly want to know what's up with that are there in fact we have biometric technology biometric technology and proprietary algorithms i had a lot of sources in that community who were saying that they were they don't know of any kind of special technology or algorithms that exist that would be able to accomplish what he said it would be able to accomplish. You have to remember that the company announced 2023 revenue of little more than $7.7 million, okay, and a net loss last year of $835 million. Ooh, now, what they claim, what they said was, uh, their lofty projections were 
that they would take in more than $990 million in gross revenue in 2022 and more than $3 billion in gross revenue in 2023. Instead, in 2023, as I said, they took in $7 million, uh, $7.7 million in revenue and a hit of $835 million, um, more than double what the company reported losing in 2022. Yeah, it sounds like something's a bit off. John Ruiz is asleep. Cocaines.